Yeah, I'll try to get through it really quick. Not too much to cover on this one I have. So basically we're taking um, the things that Ajith has talked about um, as far as annotation in general and trying to apply it to some of the, the languages that are now used for describing sensor data. So I said before there's this Open Geospatial Consortium which um, does most of the, the modeling in our domain. Um, and it's, it's a huge organization's body, so there's, I, this was taken a while ago, but 330 companies, government agencies, institutions, and they develop these standards for sensor, sensor data, sensor observations. And basically it works, the sensor web enablement, this is the name of the project, it works as a middleware between sensor networks and the observations generated and applications um, that want to use this data. So applications just have to conform to the standards and, and they just work. Um, the same as the networks. So these are the basic languages. So there's an observation and measurements languages, which is what I explained, which is very similar to the ontology I showed earlier. So this is information model for observations and sensing. The geographic GML, which is for um, geographical information, so you might be more interested in, in these types of things. Um, transducer ML, which is a real-time streaming protocol, so how do you, it actually has an encoding for um, streaming data from one sensor to another within a network. And sensor ML, which describes the more hardware-related the processes of uh, sensors. So this is more related to the second ontology I showed. But also they define services. Um, so there are these three standard services. So there's There's an SLS service, a sensor observation service. So we've actually implemented one of these. We'll show you tomorrow um, how that works. Um, there's an SPS, a sensor planning service, um, which can um, kind of plan or um, task very complex queries. Um, and sensor alert service that can alert you when particular observations are found of these kind of things. So these have standard interfaces, um, so you can query them the same no matter who developed them. <coughs> I'm not sure how well you could see this, but basically I, this is a sensor ML model. So you have the UML model on the left, you have some XML on the right. Um, and this is how it would be defined within the, the OGC. And what we want to show is that, you know, there's certain concepts within this XML that might have more expressive ontological representations. So here they're talking about companies and people and these kind of things that we could have like maybe in a social networking ontology. So a more descriptive um, concepts defined in the ontology. Um, you could have spatial concepts, like you were saying. We could have more expressive spatial concepts in a spatial ontology to represent those kind of things. Um, and we could have uh, a temporal ontology to do temporal reasoning on you know, uh, times and dates. So Corey, sweet as it is from the OGC, has they have not represented it as an ontology yet? It's still just it's it's repre right. okay. So they modeled it as UML, right? Okay. Which is more expressive than XML, but then they encoded it within XML, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a tree-based structure. There are very there's limitations to what you can do. Okay. Um, but I, I've talked to the OGC people guys to death, right? GML, for example, was written with RDF-like structure in mind. Mm -hmm. so, it, so you'll learn about RDF tomorrow, but it's basically a triple pattern. So it's a graph-based structure with nodes and edges. So two nodes would be, two nodes in the edge would be a triple. Um, so, so what you're saying is you could take that and use that, that research as the basis for creating an ontology from. Right, so that's what we did yeah. with, with the ontology I showed. What I'm trying to show here is this is the way the data is going to be out there on the web, right? These are standards. People are using them now. But what we want to do is take, you know, these ideas of just adding little bits of metadata to this to provide model reference to our ontological descriptions. So then we can, can distill the RDF data and the ontological data from this. Right. So this is probably just a repeat of what was said earlier, so we want to add metadata to the standard sensor web languages. Um, 
And this is accomplished through model references, so similar to what he showed with Sosdol. Um, so model references which are links to an ontology or ontological concepts. So there's actually several different ways of doing this. One, RDFA. Um, so I won't go into, you've already heard what RDFA is. Um, but what maybe he didn't mention is that he talked about RDFA in the context of HTML. But actually it's been adopted by the XHTML community because it was originally developed for XML. Right? And even within the spec, they say it's been heavily adopted by XHTML. The spec's written for XHTML, but it's not specifically for XHTML. It's for XML. Um, so there's been look, um, research into looking how to embed this into the sensor web enablement languages to add this ontological metadata. Uh, another approach, um, which is probably a bit farther along, is the use of XLink. So this is also a W3C standard. Um, so this is actually used for providing relationships between concepts within an XML document. So XML is a tree. Well, in order to break the tree structure and make more of a graph, you can use XLink. Um, and we can actually use these for our model references. Um, and so XLink has several attributes, but two of them are href, which supplies data um, that allows X, XLink application to find a remote resource. So this is very, very similar to um, uh, an object property within uh, OWL, like Satya was telling you earlier. So you can use href to point to um, uh, instances within an ontology. And that would be, or it seems to be, it's still up in the air, but it seems to be a correct interpretation of this. Um, also, there's another attribute called role, which describes the meaning of a resource. And we can use this to point to concepts within an ontology. Um, most of this is still very much in the air, it's still research. Um, but there is, within the same W3C incubator group I showed you, there's a task force to look at these standards and see what is the best way to do this within the sensor's data, within the sensor's domain. I'm actually heading up this particular um, aspect. So here, here's an example of XLink. I should, we had some examples of RDFA, but for time I won't show you. And plus, within our own applications, we're actually using the XLink approach. So here's a, a short snippet of observation and measurements. And you can see here, um, so say we have a sensor's ontology. <clears throat> here we have a, an href link from a procedure, which we know this concept from the ontology. This is... Um, the actual sensor, right? So this would be the relationship to a sensor from the observation. And so the sensor is actually defined here. And you can see that it's actually the URI from our ontology. So this is actually a model reference to the concept. So if you if your system was sophisticated enough, it could go to the ontology and extract um, more information about this particular sensor. And likewise, we also can do the same thing for phenomena. So we want to say that we have some complex phenomena here that we're representing. And one component of that is a precipitation phenomena, which is also described in our ontology. All right, you can't see this one at all. But this one actually, I'll try to explain it. It actually has data represented. So it's an observation with data. So. Um, there's a timestamp for the observation, a start time, an end time, and coordinates. And up here is actually metadata describing this data here. So if you could see it up top, this will be metadata describing this start time. This will be metadata describing this end time. Um, so basically, we're using XLink role and XLink href to point to concepts within the ontology. So these actually point to concepts, and this the href will point to an instance, but this would actually be the data value that we showed before. So if you wanted to extract this and make RDF, uh, you would kind of have to know these relationships. And how to do this is not actually known, but we're working on it. Um, it, it seems fairly straightforward. So I'll try to show you some examples.
Yeah. Okay, so Ajit told you about different types of services, right? So WSDL and these kind of things. Well, within the SOS, the Sensor Observation Service, they have their own type of WSDL, right? So they have something called Git Capabilities, right? And it's an XML document that works just like WSDL works. So it basically tells you everything you want to know about that service. Um, so what we've done is we've implemented an SOS, but within our Git Capabilities documentation, we actually provide the um, model references to our ontology. So here you would say, okay, there's a system that we're that you're you're able to access through the to the service, right? And that cert, that that system is a composite, right? Um, and it's made up of many different um, sensors, right? So you know, seven, six or seven, and we actually have links to each one of those within our ontology. Um, similarly, it's able to capture certain properties. This the system is able to capture certain properties, like wind direction, precipitation, dew point, and this is actually pointing to concepts within our ontology as well. So another example, this would be an O&M document. So this is actually the data from an observation, for example. Um, so let's see. Right. So this is an observation collection, um, and this is one one sensor within that that generated a particular observation. So there's a model reference to that particular sensor. Um, you know, it, it has some observed property. Um, so the property would be air temperature which also has a model reference, um, a feature of interest. <clears throat> and then here is the, the actual data itself. So so you can actually see the structure of the data here. So the first element within the data, um, the data is separated by these at, two at um, characters. The first element would be the timestamp, so the sampling time. The second would be, for example, freezing rain. Wait. The second is a procedure, which is specified here. Um, the feature of interest would be freezing rain. Um, and the result is that the data represented. Um, actually, it's time would be time. The feature would be freezing rain. Um, the property being measured is air temperature. Um, and it has a particular leaf value associated with it, which is represented here. So you see each one of these concepts can be actually um, related back to concepts within our ontology. So what we're working on now is, based on these observations, how do we extract and create the RDF data um, as, as you showed with like the RDF data store, which can automatically generate that. But we want to do it from these types of data sources. about it. That actually makes sense. Mm. I hope so. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow we're going to give a demonstration on RDF. So actually how the data, not, not the schema that we showed today, but how the data is formatted. Yeah. How, do you, how do you query that data? Um, and then we're going to try to show you some um, more general stuff about our sensors project. So I'll show you the service we developed and that kind of thing. If we have time, we'll show you some of the reasons we did as well. Great. Okay. Thank you.